In this video, we're going to introduce the second law of thermodynamics. So in the last lecture, we looked at this link between spontaneity and entropy, and we talked about it in a bit of a qualitative manner. We looked at a few different processes and we talked about whether they would be spontaneous or not and how that would affect whether they would be you know, likely to occur and how entropy kind of tied into that, right? This idea of disorder or randomness. So the second law of thermodynamics is going to add a layer on top of that. It's going to add a solid foundation to this link between spontaneity and entropy. So what the second law of thermodynamics states is that in any spontaneous process, there's always an increase in the entropy of the universe, right? And this language here is very careful, right? The entropy of the universe. So you can always find a singular process where the entropy is actually decreasing, right? So take, for example, in the previous video, I said that if um, that the entropy of a solid is lower than the entropy of a liquid. So obviously, if you freeze something, you're going to decrease the entropy of that substance. But the entropy of the universe is always increasing, right? There's going to be um, there's going to be compensation for that entropy loss in the environment that will make sure that the entropy of the universe is always increasing. This is a uh, law of thermodynamics. So um, so the entropy of the universe is always increasing. So the entropy of the universe is actually the uh, change in the entropy of the universe is going to be equal to the changes in entropy of the system and the surroundings. Keep in mind, there's a fundamental principle of thermodynamics that you have. All, you always have to determine what system you're studying and then everything else is uh, is deemed the surroundings. Right. So this Delta S system would be the change in entropy for your system. So whatever thing you're going to describe thermodynamically, whether it's a chemical reaction or a gas sample or what have you. And then this is the change in the entropy of your surroundings. Right. And the sum of those gives you the change in entropy of the universe. Right. So basically what this says, right, if if the second law of thermodynamics, if we take this statement, right, basically what we're saying is that a positive change in the entropy of the universe. Corresponds to a spontaneous process. Right. Whereas a decrease in the entropy of the universe. Corresponds to a non spontaneous process. Right. Or if it's uh, if it's a process that can be reversed, then you can say that it's uh, spontaneous in the reverse direction if you have a negative delta S of the universe. Right. OK, so let's see how we can actually identify whether uh, a process is going to be uh, spontaneous or not. Right. Um, so let's see. So let's let's map out our thermodynamic system. So let's say we have some system. I'll use a different color here. Let's say we've got some system here. Let me might make that a little bit smaller. All right. So this is our system, right? We got our system here. I'll put S Y S there for system and everything on the outside of it is our surroundings. So I'll use a dotted circle here for the surroundings, right? So we've got our system and our surroundings. Let's say that we have heat flowing from our system to the surroundings, right? So I'm gonna draw an arrow here. And keep in mind that heat is uh, denoted by the lowercase Q for heat. So heat is flowing from the surroundings to the system. So I ask you, um, can we figure out whether this is spontaneous or not? Do we know whether this is spontaneous or not? Well, no, we can't really figure out just from knowing the direction of the heat flow, whether the system is whether this is going to be a spontaneous process or not. Right. So keep in mind, when we talked about enthalpy, right? All you need to know was whether heat was flowing from the system or into the system in order to figure out whether something was endothermic or exothermic. But here we can see it's a little bit more uh, robust because we have to know the magnitude of the change in heat from the surrounding to the system or else we can't really say whether this is spontaneous or not. I mean, there might be a, a increase in uh, entropy of the system, but you know, how great is that change? Is it enough to overcome the the loss in entropy of the surroundings? You know, it's, it's, it's going to be dependent on the magnitude of all of these things. So what I want to do is put a little bit more specificity here. 
right? So uh, I'm going to draw a second thermodynamic system here, right? Just like the first, I'll use a dotted circle for the surroundings, solid circle for the system, right? So we got two different thermodynamic systems. Let's label them both. We got, we'll call this guy system A, we'll call this guy system B. In both cases, we're going to have heat flowing from the surroundings to the system, right? And, and in fact, it's going to be the exact same quantity of heat that's flowing from the surroundings to the system. However, I'm going to have each of these, uh, each of the surroundings at two different temperatures, right? So we'll have T1 and T2, right? So we got a temperature T1 and a temperature T2 for our surroundings. And what I'm going to say here is that T1 is going to be much, much greater than T2, right? So this is what we'll set up for the uh, comparison of these systems. They're at two different temperatures and the temperature in the surroundings in system A is going to be much, much greater than the temperature two here in system B, right? Now Q is going to be the same in both cases. Let me write that down. So Q is the same in both cases. Right, so the same exact magnitude of heat is transferred from the surroundings to the system. So, um, so now the question is, which one is going to have a greater um, change in the delta S of the surroundings? Right, uh, in which one would the disorder uh, decrease the most? Right. So, in order to answer this question, right we have to figure out which one of these temperatures is greater. We know that it's temperature one. So that means that the magnitude of the change in the surroundings is actually gonna be much greater in temperature two since it's the lower temperature, right? So the magnitude of delta S of the surroundings is gonna be much greater in system B than it would be in system A because it had less thermal energy to begin with, right? So it's giving, a certain amount of heat, but it had less thermal energy to give in the first place. So that's going to be a, have a much greater effect on its entropy. So the example that I like to use in this case um, is let's say that you have two friends and you ask both of those friends for $10, right? And your first friend is rich. Let's say he has $5,000, right? To his name. And he gives you $10, right? but your other friend only has $15, but he also gives you the $10, right? Which one is it gonna mean more to you? I mean, either way, you're getting 20 bucks, right? You're getting the same amount of money, but it's gonna mean a little bit more coming from your friend that only had $15 to his name versus your friend that had $5,000 because you know it's gonna have a bigger impact on his finances, right? Same type of deal here, where if, a, if the surroundings has less thermal energy to give in the first place, it's going to have a greater effect on its entropy to give the same amount of heat, right? So, so keep that analogy in mind when you're thinking about the magnitude of delta S um, in these cases. If there's a, a less amount of thermal energy here to begin with, then it's going to be a little bit more um, impactful on the entropy of the system. Okay, so we see here that it not only depends on the amount of heat transferred, it also depends on the temperature, um, how we calculate delta S. So that leads us to an equation. So if we want to calculate the entropy change in the surroundings, right? So if we want to calculate delta S of the surroundings, right, we're going to have a ratio between the quantity of heat released by the system Right, so I'll say quantity of heat. And this is typically in joules, but it can be in kilojoules or whatever energy value that you're using to quantify your transfer of heat. So the quantity of heat that's released by the system over the uh, temperature, right? The temperature of your surroundings. Right. So we have this ratio between the energy transferred and the amount of the temperature of your surroundings. Right. So and I, I kind of mentioned this in the previous course, but I want to reiterate this here that uh, you always want to make sure you're using the absolute temperature, the Kelvin scale when you're doing these calculations. If you use Celsius or Fahrenheit, you might get uh, erroneous negative values that will throw off your interpretation of the change of the entropy. 
Okay, so uh, to write this as an equation, right, I'm going to write the equation for the delta s of the surroundings. Um, the equation is going to be negative, and I'll talk about that negative sign in just a second, right? Negative delta h, right? Delta h is our change in enthalpy, right? That we talked about this in a previous course where this is a thermodynamic uh, variable that's used to quantify the amount of heat that's being transferred in a system, right? So uh, we have, we can use that here to quantify the amount of heat transferred. That's going to be over the temperature. Right, so this would be our equation to calculate delta S of the surroundings, right? So now about this negative sign. So this is just to maintain our sign convention here. Right, so we know that if heat is, if, in, if heat is transferred from the system to the surroundings, that's going to increase the entropy of the surroundings, right? But we know that if heat is released by the system, it's going to give a negative enthalpy value, right? So if that enthalpy value is negative, this negative sign just ensures that we're able to interpret that as an increase in entropy versus if heat is absorbed by the system, we know that this enthalpy is going to be positive, but that's going to be a decrease in the entropy of the surroundings, right? Okay, so um, so that gives us an equation for entropy. And what I'm gonna do in the next video is use this equation to solve some problems. So we'll be given some scenarios where we're asked to evaluate whether the entropy in the, system, in the surroundings is increasing or decreasing. Um, and we'll be able to use this equation in order to calculate that.